that, if you guys didn't know, we've been in a little bit of a series. My dad kind of mentioned it and kind of tied it together last week. Um, but it's called Under the Microscope. Everybody say, Under the Microscope. Yeah, we definitely went down. Um, under the Microscope. Now, what do I mean by that? I think a lot of us as believers or even just people, right? If I say out, say, a subject or something that describes, a lot of the times we have an, in, uh, an interwoven wiring that kind of can summarize what that is. So, like, if you're a Christian, if I say the term salvation, well, most of us have a, have a preconceived idea or notion of what that is. Faith or Jesus or, and, and a few weeks ago, we talked about temptation. All things that I think as believers, no, but we're all going to be like, okay, I have a basic understanding of what that is. And I would say that that kind of works well in our world today. Is that we have a basic understanding of what our understanding is, I should say, of a certain subject. And very rarely do we take a, a word that we think we already know and put it under a microscope, so to speak, and actually assess its true meaning. What do I mean by that? Today, I want to talk about something that I feel like a lot of Christians, when I throw it out there, we're all going to be like, oh, it has nothing to do with me. And that's decade, that's millenniums old. And the term is idolatry. Now, if you notice, I've spelled it a little bit differently. Because here's the deal. I think in our day and age, if I were to say, hey, how many of us worship idols? Right? Nobody's going to be like, yeah, man, that's me. Like this week, had a really rough idol week. Right? Nobody's going to be like, yeah, I got 14 carved images, an Asherin pole, and you know, I go to an idol temple. Like, I, and if you do, just come talk to me after. <laughs> I'm not trying to be convicting or critical, but there's, there's some room there to have some conversations. But that's the best way I can put it. Uh, but really, I think for a lot of us, when I say the term idolatry, there's immediately maybe a concept or a, a symbolism or a belief structure that permeates to the surface of our minds that defines what that term is. Now, for me personally, right, I've, I've been kind of exploring this topic because I believe idolatry is not necessarily an Old de Testament definition, but there was a switch that happened in the Old Testament that in turn, from that moment on, affected every generation of believers since. And you might be intrigued to find where that is, and we're going to talk about it today. But before we do, the number one commandment, no other gods before me. Now, how many of you guys know, right? In my house, if you have one commandment, right? I know growing up, we didn't have like one commandment, but I will say like you didn't talk back or you didn't give sass. And if you did, you couldn't hang out with your friends for a long time, <laughs> right? My dad actually had a term, he'll remember this, but whenever you would like talk back in like a sassy way, he called it the creep. Be like, oh, I'm sensing a little bit of the creep coming up. Like, no, it's not the creep, it's not the creep. I wanna see my friends. <laughs> No, I sense the creep, you know? He's gonna laugh when he hears this, right? It's, it's like, because essentially, like I said, we, we have common rules that make up our lives where we have singular, like, a couple main things that we just don't do. Now, with God, it's like, just have nothing before me. That's essentially what it is. Just have nothing before me. Now, a lot of us, if I ask you, you know, do you have nothing before God? It's just easy to be like, well, duh. I've been saved for 16 decades. Oh, that's 160 years. <laughs> Right. I've been saved forever. I, I, of course I don't have any you know, things before God. But when we actually start to break down a little bit of what idolatry is, is it's not this thing of, oh, let's all bow down to a carved image. But it truly is this thing where our eyes take our focus away from God and onto something that doesn't replace him in worship, but just replaces him with our time. And I think this is the, the day and age where all culture and society wants you to do is take your eyes off of him and just put it on things that'll waste your time. That'll just get you to not think about him, get you to maybe not live like him. And for some of us, right, if I broke down idolatry in that term, what's taking your eyes off of the Father and distracting you from who you actually are supposed to be, we probably would be able to name a few things. You know, the earliest reference in, in the fall of man is what you see is Adam and Eve are on earth, and this is in Genesis chapter three, I'm gonna read it in a second, but actually the language that's used, we miss out on a lot. And what do I mean by that is because ultimately God comes to man and he says, hey guys, here's the deal. Don't, we're not worship. they don't even know any other God at this time. But you know what he says is he says, just follow me, keep my commands, and stay away from one tree, just one tree. 
And what happens? Obviously, we know the story. The serpent tempts the woman. She sins, falls into sin with the husband. And then because of it, mankind separates from its original union with the father. But listen to this, actually. I want you guys to focus on some words. Genesis 3, 5 through 7, it says this. And this is the serpent talking to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the, women, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed, sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Pause, right? So the original sin was in a place of, wow, you know, let's eat this fruit. Let's not glorify God. Let's not follow what he's saying. It's the appearance of something that's good that's not. Isn't that interesting, right? That the original people who fell away from God weren't because they were like, oh, today, you know what we're going to do? Disobey God. You know what they decided? You know what it was? That looks good, but God says it's bad, but it still looks good, so I'm going to do it. Man, doesn't that sound like just the world sometimes? Just what it means to live kind of a fleshly lifestyle is, well, that looks good, and I know there may be something bad in it, but it looks really good, and so I'm just going to hope that it's good. And in the long run, we might find out that it's bad. See, this is, the, this is really the foundation of where we're going today, but we're going to unpack it even more because when you understand fully where this takes the children of Israel, you're going to be like, how in the heck did this happen? You know, for some of us, maybe we don't have an understanding of idolatry in the Old Testament, and we're going to get really biblical level today, which I hope you got your Bible helmets on for. What do I mean by this is that... What you actually find is that idolatry doesn't necessarily, it exists, but not in the form of its mentioning as it pertains after the children of Israel. What I mean is before the children of Israel, so before Exodus, you don't see a whole lot of mention of idol worship because really God had not created a people for himself. What do I mean by this? What happens is, is God creates man and then man kind of goes wayward. And so God shows up and what he does is he says, listen, I'm not going to abolish all of man. What I'm going to do is I'm going to choose a godly man. I'm going to bless his lineage. And through that lineage, I'm going to prove to the world that the best way to live is by following me. And that man is Abraham. So what happens is, is Abraham produces this lineage of God's favor and covenant that is on him. However, over the course of time, that family ends up in Egypt because of a famine. However, in Egypt, what happens is, is instead of leaving Egypt at the end of the famine, they settle. And when they went to Egypt, they had about 60 people. When they're leaving Egypt, they have over a million people. So multiplication. A lot's happening. Now what's happened though is actually the Egyptians look at the favor of their lives and say, you know what? Something's going on. They will overpower us. We need to enslave them. So what happens is, is the Israelites, the people who are the covenant uh, communion and relationship with God, the hand of favor that is supposed to be over their lives is now enslaved in bondage to man. Now, for some of us, like I said, we don't know where idolatry comes up before this other than people are worshiping other things. However, what happens in Egypt is that there's a belief system in place in the Old Testament that if you are enslaved or come under another country, its gods are more powerful than yours. So actually what you might be intrigued to find out is that the children of Israel in Egypt, yes, believed in God, but were subservient to the Egyptian gods. And how do we know this? This is where it gets interesting. I've had a lot of great discussions where people go, you know, why did the children of Israel, why did God have to bring 12 plagues? Where did that come from? Why did that have to happen? Why didn't Moses just show up, you know, drop his, his, uh, his staff and just say, you're letting them go and it's over. And then boom, everybody, okay, we're oh, all right, they can go. They're out of here. But actually what you see is that if you research each one, of those, each one of those specific plagues, is it's targeting an Egyptian god. And if you know, once again, this is back to the story of it, is if you know anything about what these Egyptian gods are entailing, is essentially Egypt has enslaved the god of Israel, Yahweh, and now the god of Yahweh is coming back and he's abolishing each one 
of these gods before his people can leave. Why? Because he's the God of all. You know, if you want to know, if you want to get even more nitty gritty, we'll do a little history lesson here, is that the second plague actually that was brought about in Exodus was the plague of frogs. Now, many of us are like, why would you pick a plague of frogs? Like, a lot of us, we read this like, oh, plague of frogs, that's interesting. Okay, let's keep reading. Like, for me, I read and go, what in the heck? Like, that is the most random thing, a plague of frogs. You know why they did that? The Egyptians had a god, and the gods, uh, I'm not even going to be able to pronounce it, it's H. E-Q-T. That's the frog god of Egypt. Now, you want to take it a step further? Is that actually, if you killed a frog that in that day and time, you could be killed for it because you were killing a god. So when frogs overran the kingdom, most of us would be like, why didn't they just kill all the frogs? Like, no offense, if I got 500 frogs in my house, all of them is dead. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. Like, I ain't chilling here in Ribbit all night in my room. Like, we're not doing that. Like, they're done. But listen here, right? Frogs overran the country. Why did they? Because it was a frog god and people were afraid to kill him. Man, the Bible's fascinating when you start to actually learn it, believe it or not. So listen, God comes. What is he doing? He's abolishing all of these gods saying, nope, I can defeat that one. I can defeat that one. I can defeat that one. I can defeat that. All these idols, all these men. He's defeating, 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 defeating. Then listen here, right? He gets them out of Egypt, and in bringing them out of Egypt, what we see is the very first idol that pops up is a golden calf. Now, some of us, once again, my brain thinks, how in the world? Like, it's, what happens is Moses, Moses goes up on Mount Carmel to get, to get the Ten Commandments, and while he's gone, everybody goes, Moses ain't around! We got to get something to worship and give sacrifices to, because if we get left here, we're all dead. So what happens, right? They build this gold calf. Moses comes down from the mountain and he's like, are you guys dumb? Are you guys dumb? And actually a, a plague breaks out against the people. Some of them end up dying. But what happens is it's through repentance and through Moses realigning them, they come back into alignment. No idols. We're following God. There's nothing. So up to this point, what we know is the children of Israel have, have really only bowed to one idol and that's the golden calf. Now, they've complained, they've grumbled, they've, they've, ad, they've doubted, they've literally said, God, what are you doing? But they have not literally said, we are going to go worship other things. They have not because they know that God's hand of favor and protection has been on them, even if it was uncomfortable, it has. Now, listen here, though, because this is where it gets even better. Some of us were like, well, how did they know the hand of protection and favor was on them? That's a great question to ask. There's a passage of scripture. If you know this, the children of Israel, before they enter the promised land, are stuck for 40 years in the wilderness. Now, that's a pretty strict punishment. But at the same time, they doubted that God could give them the thing that he promised to give them. So what happens? God says, okay, well, that unbelieving generation, I'm going to do away with in the wilderness. I'm going to bring up a generation of faith and give them the promise. So... Here's the deal. How do you go around for 40 years in the wilderness? Yeah, they have Moses, but Moses couldn't do it on his own. Listen to this passage, right? And it's found in Numbers 9, 15 to 23. And I want us to understand the context of how you could walk away from God when stuff like this is happening. How could you worship idols when stuff of this magnitude is leading you? Let's read. It says this, on the day that the tabernacle was set up, a cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of testimony, and at evening it was over the tabernacle like the appearance of fire until the morning. So it was always. The cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. And whenever the cloud lifted from above the tent, after the people of Is then the people of Israel would set out. And in the place where the cloud settled down, there the people of Israel would camp. At the command of the Lord, the people of Israel set out. At the command of the Lord, they camped. As long as the cloud rested over the tabernacle, they remained in that camp. Pause. Imagine if I said, hey, you're going to take a road trip for 40 years. Just bear with me. We're going somewhere. People are like, well, that's a really long road trip. And here's how you're going to get around. Is you're just going to drive. And when you look out and see a cloud descended on, on a campground, of fire, you'll know where to stop there. How many of us know that would be a very interesting road trip? But pause, this is essentially how they lived in the wilderness. Dead serious, for 40 years, when that cloud would lift, they would walk. And when that cloud would drop, 
Now, the tabernacle in that time was, was a tent of meeting, and so actually it could be torn down and re put back up. The Levites would do that. And they actually had a strict way of setting up around that tabernacle in tribal order so that they could tear down and set up wherever that cloud went. So listen here, the people of Israel are literally following the fire of God every single day. How could you walk away from that? Like, how could you look at your neighbor and say, Hey, do you want to go find other idols? I know that there's a fire over here that's over our tabernacle that's been leading us for years that goes up into the clouds and descends and up and descends. But let's just go find something else. How could you decide to do that, right? You want to take it a step further? Listen to this. Listen to what they even they, they would sew into their clothes in Numbers 15, 37 to 41. Then the Lord said to Moses, speak to the people of Israel and tell them to make tassels on the corner of all their garments throughout gen their generations and to put a cord of blue on the tassel of each corner. And it shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commands of the Lord to do them and to not follow after your own heart and your own eyes, which you are inclined to. I don't need to read that word. Pause. Literally, they have woven into their clothing a reminder to follow God and don't walk away. They've got a fire in front of them descending from the clouds that literally tells them, follow this. How in the world could idolatry be established and something that becomes a struggle throughout the entire Old Testament? How does that even happen? You know, I did a teaching here a few years back on judges. In judges, I believe there's 15 different instances where they'd walk away, come back, walk away, come back, walk away, come back, walk away, come back, walk away. I mean, it's incredible how often the children of Israel would stumble into idolatry over and over and over and over again. But here's the thing. What I found was, I, I think, is the bedrock for what idolatry comes from. And it's a passage of scripture that a lot of us maybe have never heard or don't know. And actually what's happening is this fire tent that's going up in the clouds and going up and going down and going up and going down is leading them. And in leading them, they're actually conquering every person in the land because God is for them. They're following him. They're following his commands. They're following his direction. They're following where he's taking them. And guess what? It's going really good. So what happens is, is this king, Balak, he says, man, we need to find a guy who can curse these people. And hopefully that curse works because if not, we are dead. So what he does is he finds a guy by the name of Balaam. And Balaam, he says, hey, I will, get, I will make you a gajillionaire if you can curse these people and that curse will stick. Because I'm telling you, if you can't, we are in trouble. And what it actually says is that Balaam rose to curse the people and instead would pronounce blessing. And he'd pronounce blessing. And he'd pronounce blessing. And after four days, he'd been trying to curse these people and could not curse them. And he actually came to the king and he says, listen, I can't pronounce a curse over something God has blessed. I can't do it. So Balak is sitting there and he is distraught. What am I going to do? Right? And like I said, this is where I think is the very beginning of where I think idolatry comes from. It says this in Revelation, get this, Revelation 2.14. Nevertheless, I have a few, few things about you. There are some among you who hold to the teachings of Balaam. Pause. This actually isn't even found in the Old Testament. This isn't even found in Numbers, where I'm reading out of. So from Numbers 22 to 24 in the Old Testament, Balaam is pronouncing these blessings over and over and over and over and over and over. He's pronouncing these blessings, pronouncing these blessings, pronouncing these blessings. But guess what? Finally, he has to leave the king and like, I can't do anything. Sorry, I'm done. And what happens is, is this passage of scripture happens where what we see is that as he's leaving, he pulls this king aside. And listen to this. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You, follow, you hold to the teachings of Balaam who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to eat things that were sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Numbers 25, that king that paid Balaam that couldn't get the curse out, what he did is he sent things in that pleased the eyes of the Israelites. 
They looked at the women uh, that they're not supposed to be in covenant union with. They're created only to marry and reproduce with the children of God. But guess what? They look good. They're, they're only eating manna in the wilderness. Guess what? Man, that food looks really, really good. You know where temp, not temptation, we already talked about that. You know where idolatry comes from? Is when you perceive something you really, really want. So much so that it can replace the truth of God and influence your life to go in a way that you didn't anticipate, but you allowed your eyes to lead you there. See, this is where idolatry comes from. It doesn't come from people waking up and saying, well, today's the day, guys. Let's worship idols. You know what it is? It's putting things in front of your eyes that replace the things that God wants for your life. It's focusing on things that maybe aren't the most godly, but you know what? Culture says this is what I should strive for. You know, this is, this is what success looks like because this is what's been put in front of my eyes. This is what a, a health looks like. This is what being a great person looks like. This is, we can put everything in front of our eyes from a worldly perspective and convince ourselves it's right and miss that it's actually wrong because it doesn't line up with who God is. That's the challenge, church. Can you look through your eyes at this world and say, I know that this looks good, but I know God is good, and I choose that. That's a tough place to be in. I mean, how could you go from literally looking at a cloud of fire leading you, having, having stuff on your clothing that reminded you not to walk away and walking away because it looked just too good? I don't think anybody wakes up or gets married and on their marriage day says, man, I want to have an affair. I don't think anybody says that. But you know what happens is it just looks good. I don't think any one of us wait that when we get to know Christ, go, man, I really want to follow God. And in the back of our minds say, yeah, but I'm going to walk away from him soon. You know what happens is, man, that just looks good. And this is just hard. Isn't it just easy, the temptation of life, to take over your eyesight and in turn get you to confuse what you're created for, for what just looks good? You know what success is? The appearance of it. You know what happiness is? The appearance of it. I mean, we can genuinely come up with a definition of everything that we strive after based off of just what we've seen. I mean, if I were to say, hey, what does a good time look like? All of us, we in our minds can have visual pictures that determine what a good time is. If I said, hey, what does a perfect day look like? You have visual images. Why do you think the enemy wants to attack your eyesight with things that aren't of God to replace him? That's what idolatry is. It's not, hey, let's all worship a microscope today. No, idolatry is, hey, let me put something in your vision that will get you distracted from who you're created to be. See, for some of us, we're looking and saying, well, I'm not really created to be the guy with the microphone. I'm not really created to, to be full-time ministry, all of that. I promise you there is a design and a purpose within your field that 100% can glorify and exalt God. And you believing that there isn't is already you buying into the vision and perception that there isn't. Because all throughout Scripture, it says in the Old Testament that he anointed tent makers he anointed construction workers. He, um, he anointed welders, people who, who made bronze pots. He, he anointed everybody for the construction of the temple and for us today for the construction of the kingdom. All of our talents can be used to build the kingdom. It's up to if you believe through your perception that yours can. Some of us are saying, well, I'm a stay-at-home mom. The best thing you can do is raise your children right. Because there's plenty of people who are not raising them with God. But I promise you this, is if you're raising up a generation that does, it's the greatest thing you could ever do. See, a lot of us, we just lose sight because the perception says you can't. But God says, no, you can't. Idolatry is looking at this world and saying, I have to do it how the world does it. Instead of looking at God and saying, man, I trust you. I'm focused on the cloud. I'm focused on the fire that leads my life. I'm focused on the good of your word and what you've promised to do. I'm focused on what it means to follow you. See, that's, that's what it looks like to have eyes that see. You know, a lot of us, we have full-time jobs just looking at our phones all week. 
You know, it's funny because it's like we we spend most of our, a lot of people spend a ton of time, not me because I limited it big time this past year, but a lot of us spend most of our time. If I told you, you know, 2.8 stars, you're going to spend a lot of time on. All of us would be like 2.8 out of 5. That doesn't sound that good. Well, that's what Facebook's rated on the App Store. It's like we, we spend a ton of time on that thing and it's 2.8 stars. If you told me, hey, you know, we, you want to go to a restaurant, 2.8 stars every single night, I would say absolutely not. I've got a five-star Bible, five-star time with the Lord that I'm going to choose over that. You know, A.W. Towser says this, and it's a great passage or, or statement he says. He said, if God is exalted, a thousand minor problems can be solved at once. You know, Western idolatry, even Pastor Stephanie texted me this before service. Idols that we don't think but can easily replace God, pleasure and enjoyment, our families, putting our families as the number one importance and not having any spiritual backing for ourselves. Opinions of others, pleasing others. Man, a lot of us, all we live is not actually for the happiness and fulfillment of our lives and our spiritual lives, but just for the approval of man. If we don't think we idolize that in this country, we've missed it because that's the truth. Appearances can be our sole focus to be perceived as somebody who has it all yet hollowed out on the inside. I pray today that we're challenged that idolatry isn't an idol. It's idolatry. And our eyesight, the things that we worship, the things that we pursue, the things that we're heavily focused on, the things that in turn dictate our realities are all steered through here. You know, spiritually, my final parting thought is this. From a spiritual perspective, our spirit is supposed to influence our mind, which then influences what we see. So no matter what, when we're going through things, we know, okay, God says this, and it may not look like this, but I trust he's good. I trust he has me. See, that's what, it, that's what it is. But here's the problem. Culture is everything through the eyesight. Well, if it looks this way, then it is this way. And if it is this way, then I can doubt the goodness of God. I can doubt if he has a plan for my life. I can doubt if he's even real because this is what it looks like. And this is what he says it should look like. But faith is what we walk by, not sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. That's a passage of scripture that's talked about a lot. And I encourage you today that if all we do is perceive our existence through the lens of our lives, we may or may not be an idolatry. But the good news is, is you can get out when you realign your eyesight with what God sees and with what God knows. In closing, they're going to throw some questions up on the screen. And uh, I think today it's important for us to just assess and some of us, maybe this is the only time we've reflected all week. You know, you can always tell people who really don't have a reflection time because it's like, it just feels so awkward to just sit and just let yourself process. To just sit and just let yourself think about something. To just sit and let it soak in. And so today what I want us to do is if you're with somebody you're comfortable with, you can talk to them a little bit. If you want to pull out your phone and take a note, if you're somebody who... Uh, is looking and saying, well, I'll write down my answers. Or you're just sitting there and you're saying, man, I'm just going to process this. I just want us all to sit here and just think about where we're at. Because hearing is good, but doing is a lot better. And we ha when we have in our hearts what we know we should do, I promise you, it's a lot easier to walk out. So I pray today we have the things that we know to do and we step forward within them. Like I said, we're going to take about two, three minutes, just quiet, and just give us a little bit of space and then we'll jump into worship.